So before you come up, Bill, I'd just like to say on behalf of the movement, thank you for the work which you've done all these many years. Thank you for producing such entertaining, informative, intellectually captivating and very useful material in your very unique way. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Still. The global economy continues to crash. Unemployment continues to spiral upwards. Government budgets are tightening dramatically in the wake of the global real estate bubble, a bubble that was specifically caused by banks being in complete control of the money supply instead of sovereign nations being in control of their national currency. That is the basic problem that we're facing, and until this problem is addressed, no amount of national austerity will stop this continuing cascade of negative economic events. England is trying the last thing there is to try. That's to dramatically cut government spending. They call it austerity. But to those of us in this room, uh, we are all acutely aware that this austerity is not going to work. So, it's our obligation to be able to say why this is not working and offer a reasonable solution, and we call that solution monetary reform. Monetary reform rests on two great inviolable pillars to me. The first one is that government borrowing must be forbidden. The second one is that banks must stop lending money they do not have. On the first one, the money power, the power to create the national money, is the most important power of a sovereign nation. In fact, it is the very definition of sovereignty. Nations do not have to borrow. Nations can create. The problem is that when a, na a nation borrows from a bank, as Proverbs tells us, the borrower becomes servant to the lender. That is not sovereignty. So what is the result? The nation becomes addicted to the loans and the banks then have power over it. So you no longer have a sovereign democracy. You have rule by banks. Political science has coined a term for this. It's called plutocracy. This is our pl primary problem with the economy of every nation today. They have allowed the national debt system to predominate. I say no more national debt. Let's use the U.S. example today. Mr. Obama has stimulated the economy with about $2 trillion. But here's the problem. He's borrowed the money. <laughs> so he's borrowed the money, mostly from the big banks, with interest attached. And then what has he done? He simply turned around and given this money, given it back to the banks, supposedly to lend to us. But no. They can, they can have a, a, sta a safer return merely by giving it to the Fed, and then the Fed pays them more interest. What kind of a system is this? It's insane. You couldn't design a worse possible system. This system just can't get any worse. Banks must stop lending money they do not have. This, as we all know, is called the fractional reserve lending system. It allows banks not to lend out twice as much money, not three times as much money, but 10 to 12 times as much money if they follow the rules. And as we know, uh, with the results of the 2008 debacle, here at least in the United States, that the big banks were leveraged 50 and 52 to 1, Freddie and Fannie were leveraged 72 to 1. Goldman Sachs was leveraged 333 to 1. And then just about six months ago, Mr. Obama gets on TV and says, you know, I think we should just eliminate the reserve requirement altogether. So 333 to 1 is not enough. Only infinity will do. If you or I did this, we would be charged with fraud and or counterfeiting. This fractional reserve system allows the banks to consolidate the wealth of the nation, and that combined with the national debt allows them to use that leverage to control the politics of the nation because their power is protected and even enhanced. Again, this is the very definition of plutocracy. Tally sticks. In 1100 AD, King Henry I, the first Norman king of England, the son of William the Conqueror, had this exact same problem. That's why he created the tally stick system, because the goldsmiths had discovered that they could control the king by withdrawing their loans of gold money. 
Since their gold money was the most convenient money to use, trading grains for deer, deerskins worked, but it was much less convenient. When they stopped lending out, there was less money in circulation and the overall supply of money dropped, and this caused a depression. The people didn't understand why there was a depression, so they blamed the king. So the goldsmiths got used to being able to bully the king by the mere threat of reducing the money supply. This is exactly what's going on today, just in a little more, and I stress, a little more sophisticated way. This power of the goldsmiths is bad enough when they only control the quantity of lending in the broad population, but it, it is further amplified when the sovereign himself is the borrower from the goldsmiths. The borrower shall be servant to the lender. So this is a two-pronged problem. When the wealthiest private citizens have control over the money supply, then the government is no longer sovereign. It is no longer the supreme power of the land and can no longer operate in the public interest. Government determined by the citizenry and directed by their elected representatives is still all that stands between us and serfdom. Rule by the rich. In today's world, the democratic aspects of government have been significantly eroded because entirely and completely because government has lost these two great pillars of truth. They are borrowing from bankers. They have lost control over the quantity of the national money. Those are the two pillars. This is why we know that no amount of austerity or further government borrowing can possibly fix this problem. This week in England, I met with some wonderful younger folks, you saw one of them just now, who have latched on to these essential truths, both formally within the monetary reform community and last night, uh, up and coming students at the London School of Economics. These young inquiring minds realize that old ways aren't working, that something is very wrong. They can't get jobs the way their parents could just a generation earlier. They are now propelled through both self-interest as well as the normal idealism of young adults to start looking outside the box of their traditional training for something that will work. <coughs> this is a great force, and this guy is taking advantage of it, and this guy is too. This is wonderfully encouraging. Now more than ever before, I am convinced that our reforms are inevitable and in the relatively near future. The truth of the manipulation of our money supply can no longer be hidden. These fresh young faces will supply sufficient youthful energy to finally break humanity free of the enslaving shackles of the debt money system. That's all. Any questions? <laughs>